Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, ciao, bonjour, namaste, jumbo. Bienvenidos. Hey, my name is Jedley. Welcome to Reading with Your Kids. We are coming to you from the beautiful, wonderful, historical neighborhood of Reedville in the equally wonderful, beautiful, and historical city of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so very honored and absolutely delighted that you're joining us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. We do that by sharing fun, thoughtful, and thought-provoking conversations with fascinating people who just happen to be writing books for kids of all ages. You can join us in this incredibly important mission by telling all of your family and friends about the show and letting them know that they can hear us on the WREB AMFM 24-7 radio network, and they can find us on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Good Pods, Amazon Music, Podcast Attic, Audible, CastBox, Player FM, Boomplay, Ghana, and wherever you find your favorite shows. We have two really fascinating guests for you today. Later in the show, we'll be meeting Leo Cadia George. She'll be here to celebrate Trumpet the Miracle Wolf Pup. It's all about an, an endangered gray wolf. And we're celebrating Wolf Awareness Week. And first up, though, the founder, the driving force behind the Chicago Toy and Game Fair, Mary Cousins, will be joining us. Hey, my friends, we are really excited. Of Reading with Your Kids podcast is returning to the Chicago Toy and Game Fair, November 9th and 10th at the Stevens Convention Center in Rosemont, Illinois. Let your imagination come to life at the Chicago Toy and Game Fair, the ultimate family play experience. Dive into hands-on fun with the hottest new toys and games, meet the inventors behind your favorite products, and even get a sneak peek at what will top holiday wish lists this year. From interactive play zones to exciting competitions and exclusive giveaways, there's something for every member of the family at the Chicago Toy and Game Fair. And don't miss the Young Inventor Challenge, where kids showcase their creativity and innovation. Who knows, you just might meet the next big inventor. Join us at the Donald E. Stevens Convention Center in Rosemont, Illinois, November 9th and 10th. Whether you're a game enthusiast or just looking for a fun weekend with the family, the Chicago Toy and Game Fair has it all. And like I said, the Reading With Your Kids podcast will be there and you may have a chance to be heard on the show. Get your tickets today and bring the magic of play to life. Visit shytag.com for details and be sure to use the discount code READ, R-E-A-D, at checkout to save on tickets. My friends, I am so excited. We are in for a treat today. Our guest is returning to Reading With Your Kids. She is the founder of the Chicago Toy and Game Fair, the largest toy and game fair in North America. She's also the senior VP of the Toy Association, and she is the lead of People of Play. Please welcome back to Reading With Your Kids, Mary Cousins. Hey, Mary, how are you? I'm fine, Jed. Um, Thank you for having me on your show. This is very exciting. I'm really excited to have you back. I had such a wonderful time um, when I was at the uh, Chicago Toy and Game Fair. I think it was 2019, right before the pandemic. And, um, boy, there's there's so much energy at the event. Uh, Just thousands and thousands of smiling faces. Everybody there is happy. They are happy. They're playing, they're having fun, they're laughing, and and they're discovering things, right? We engage them with all sorts of immersive activities, and they get to meet inventors of some of the biggest toys and games, Inventor Boppet, Jenga. They get to read with you. I mean, it's a very exciting show. It it really is, and uh, boy, I've, families have been have been loving this this show for for so very long, and. I am thrilled to be returning to the event this coming fall. The, the, now, the dates are November, is it 8th and 9th? On November 9th and 10th, a Saturday and Sunday, in um, Rosemont, Illinois, at the Donald E. Stevens Convention Center. Fabulous location, easy to get to, inexpensive parking. Um, it, it couldn't be easier. 
Yeah. Uh, and you were telling me that it's a really the, – the venue is really family-friendly. Very, very, very family-friendly. And they welcome you. And, um, you know, some convention centers are, you know, hard to navigate. And, and you don't get, like, that good feeling when you walk in. Totally the opposite in Rosemont. You feel welcome. Everything is easy to get to. There's even walkways from all the hotels and parking right into the convention center. Wow, I'm 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 so excited. Um, this year, um, who, in, in addition to my humble reading with your kid booth, what can families expect to find at this year's event? Well, we're kicking off the show with the mayor of Rosemont um, and Girl Scouts. Hundreds of Girl Scouts are going to cut the ribbon to open the fair. It'll be fun. Um, of course, we always have our Young Inventor Challenge, and you can see what the kids have invented. We'll probably have a couple hundred kids showing off their inventions. And, and actually, over the years, about a dozen of them have gotten licensed, and some of them are still in Target today. It's, um, you'll love the kids. The kids are so creative. And who better to know what kids want than kids, right? Right. And yo-yo competitions and workshops. Um, we have Moose Games has having their very, very popular, I think it's number one on many lists, Pickleball Blast competition. Gray Matter Games is having a donut challenge. And, of course, they always have the Star Wars characters, lots of Star Wars characters, <clears throat> Darth Vader, Chewbacca, the Stormtroopers, you name it. They're all there having fun, taking pictures with everybody. We even have a Star Wars lunches back this year. We haven't had that in a long time, but we have that back. Jugglers, Magic, um, Giant Games, Giant Jenga. We had the Oscar Mayer Reno Mobile this year. How fun is that? That is cool. And that is cool. Dave and Buster's will have toys and games there. We have a play and education conference for any teachers looking for some CE credits. Um, I, I mean, I could go on, but there's just so much fun, so much to do. And, of course, all the hottest toys and games for the season. Yeah. And what a great time for the Toy and Game Fair, right before the holiday season begins. Yes. Yeah. And parents can get a jump on uh, – I, you know, I'm imagining parents can go through the event like that and see where, you know, at, at each booth – the, the kids' eyes light up and they can gauge, oh, this is what my kid wants for Christmas or Hanukkah this year. A hundred percent. You are a hundred percent correct. This is where the wish lists are made up. And we also have, like, we'll, we'll have toys and games there that nobody else has seen yet, right? We have some from other countries. Um, and so you have a chance to, to give your kids something really special. And yeah. we have things for kid adults. Too, of course. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, you know, we we did that with our kids. We would uh go out of our way to find something uh that we could give them that was unique. Um not, you know, everybody has this toy, everybody has that toy. And my kids were never you know, never got into that idea of like, oh, I gotta have what everybody else has. They they always loved having something unique, something that, that no one else had. Yeah. That is, that is what a parent wants to give a child, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something that really engages them. And and one of the reasons I love having the Reading With Your Kids podcast at the Chicago Toy and Game Fair is that it really is, um, you know, it's it's going to the fair with your kids. It's all about family, all about spending time together. Yes, yes. We are very strong believers in that, and – you know, game time, maybe game night, mm -hmm. and building toys and, you know, engagement with your kids. And and that's why I think, too, Girl Scout troops, whole Girl Scout troops and Boy Scout troops come. It's, um, there's a very, there's a feeling of community, for sure, playful yeah. community. Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, Mary, talk about uh, a little bit of um, why play is so important. Well, play, I mean, first of all, for kids, we, for kids, we call it work, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's their, they're learning about the world. They're learning about their, how to use their own motor skills. It's, I think it was actually Fred Rogers, um, 
who said that, that play is a child's work. Um, brilliant man, that Fred Rogers, Mr. Mm-hmm. Rogers. But, you know, play it, it teaches kids how to socially interact with one another. Mm-hmm. It, it increases their brain synopsis. There's something called um, S, SQ, or is that what it's called? Um, there's IQ, but then there's strategic strategic intelligence, SI, right, that you you increase when you're playing, like, so that you learn how to anticipate the next person's move, mm-hmm. and SI is actually one of the highest intelligences out there, and, you know, because during COVID, so many kids weren't able to play with one another, there's a big movement now called MESH, Mental, Emotional, and Social Health. If you if somebody searches the internet for it, they'll find out about it. But teachers are so concerned, you know, that kids need to relearn how to play with one another. And there's been some long effects from it. I mean, it's still happening. And so this mesh movement um, has a lot of really great advice. If people want to read about it, we have a lot of the articles on our People of Play website. If you go there and search for mesh. But it's just play is, 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 you know, it's it's so important in -hmm. the development of people. It's really, it's one of the things that set us off from other, from animals, right? Is that, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that we've heard from uh, a number of different teachers, especially kindergarten teachers who are writing children's book and coming on the podcast is, there's so much pressure. Kindergarten, which used to be all about play and helping kids develop those social emotional skills and learning how to cooperate with each other, kindergarten has become first grade. And there's a real push to get kids reading and, and, and make kindergarten structured so that the opportunities for them to do that free play, which was so helpful, are um, few and far between in, in kindergarten these days. One, I agree with you, 100%. Um, and I know there are some kindergarten teachers that are trying to start a movement to get it back to play. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there are studies in, I think it's Japan and Finland, where if kids are allowed to play, you know, in, later into their years, they score higher in the higher grades of high school and, mm-hmm. and middle school if they were allowed to play more as a child. Yeah. My my beautiful wife uh, t- went to Finland, um, a part of a, a teacher kind of a teacher exchange, and she was blown away by um, every every forty five minutes uh, in in this school where the kids were just excelling and off the charts. Um, they would break, and the kids would have some free time to run around or play, and then in the end of that 15 minutes they come back and they do another 45 minute segment of of learning and work and then play again and it seemed so uh first off it was so different than what kids experience here where their days are structured from eight in the morning until six at night in some cases um and the kids just seemed happier and of course they were really doing uh, exceptionally well in, in in terms of of their learning wow that's interesting yeah. That I, that sounds brilliant to me. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Mary, I know that you are really passionate about the Young Inventors um, project that you're doing as, as part of Chicago Touring Game Fair. Can you talk a little bit more about that, some of the inventions that have come out of that, and, and why it is that you're so passionate about that? Oh, I do. It is definitely a passion project for us that has grown over the years. Um, so when my daughter was in fourth grade, she decided to invent a card game to help her classmates um, learn fractions. And it was called Fraction Action. And it had like a rubric at the bottom of it so that they would know. And and really, it was so simple. The kids played war with fractions so they would get a sense of what which fraction was larger than the other. And we went ahead and we produced it and it sold um, quite well. But then, you know, she got a little bit older and more into sports and, um, but we still, we still have that game, but it gave me an idea because we had started the fair a few years before to open up 
such a challenge to other kids. And it immediately kids gravitated to it and loved it. And, you know, some of the some of the winners over the years have been a girl an eight year old girl named Cooper Dean was recent and hers was chicken poop bingo. <laughs> it's there it's actually yeah, it's funny. It's it's a game she said they played in camp when she was growing up and she made a board game out of it. Awesome. And there's actually a, a yeah, it's cute. There's a chicken that pops along the board and it poops and that kind of gives you the number. It's very funny. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, Betcha Cant, I think it's still on a Target shelf that was um, that was designed by Lily and Tate Hansen. And what I love, they did a little video of, for us for to inspire other kids. And they were 11 at the time, right? And it was funny, They one of them, I think it was Tate, she said, I've been an inventor my whole life. It wasn't until I was nine years old that I started inventing toys and games. Like, it was just, I mean, this just shows you, like, some of these kids, their mindset mm-hmm. is, you know, like invention and creation. And then we had uh, this, these two girls, it was so interesting, Olivia and Brenna, they had a pirate. Um, game. It was Ship of Treasures. And they, um, you know, the first year they didn't win anything, but they took home all the feedback that our judges give them. Our judges kind of serve as mentors as well, and they're all top executives in the toy industry because they love this program. And so they took the feedback and they came back the next year making those changes. And of course, the judges remembered them and said, well, you need to tweak it just a little bit more and um and they they did and they came back their third year and they won awesome and yeah that and they got to visit the target headquarters and their game was in target and and something we didn't know until later was that they were giving um i don't know if it was half but some portion of their royalties to the children the local children's hospital because a friend of theirs had cancer and was there. It was And they didn't even tell us. It was something we kind of discovered and just in this discussion with them. Really great kids. And, of course, we've had other ones like Goo on Your Shoe, Drawn Into Crime, Squashed. Actually, the inventor of Squashed is a really interesting story. <clears throat> so the inventor is Nick Metzler. He won, I don't know, 10, probably 10 years ago. And his, it was the first cubed board game, and it was sold worldwide. And then Nick went to, you know, he used some of those royalties. He went to USC, where he then interned at Spin Master, and they saw that he was such a great designer. They offered him a job when he graduated, and he took it. And then the president of Spin Master, Anton Rabbi, mentored him for years. Wow. And now, I know, and then... Now Nick has gone off on his own, and he's working with <clears throat> crypto things I really don't understand that well. But he's very <laughs> successful and um, traveling the world, and, and he still comes back to our fair. Oh, that's wonderful! <laughs> it, right? I, I, I said that's wonderful. I, I love. I mean, I love having young authors on the show, and I love. I, I love kids being able to go out there and make their dreams come true, and. Um, and, and I love the, the, the cooperation for the, you know, and the mentoring that is happening and being birthed at the Chicago Touring Game Fair. Right. It is. You, it's these kids, you, their eyes just light up when you talk to them. They're so proud of their invent. And we put them on television often because, they, because you can feel the energy. Like these kids are so excited. So. Yeah, if you ever want to talk to some of these kids, happy to introduce you to them. Oh, we certainly want them to come on the show. Um, tell me, Mary, what inspired you to um, to launch the, the Toy Fair in the first place? Well, I started in the toy industry as a toy and game inventor and a long time ago. And then I helped other toy and game inventors, and we had this big booth called Discover Toys and Games. And because if you're a new inventor, Generally, you keep your day job, right, until you find out whether your your idea has legs. 
And so mm-hmm. I would just put everybody together in one big booth and and go to different shows. Um, and one show I went to was Essen in Germany, which coincidentally is going on right now. And I noticed that it it wasn't like most hobby shows. This this show was packed with children, like families. Schools got off. Schools literally got off for their kids um, to go to this show because play is so important in Germany. Mm-hmm. And um, and I thought we don't have anything like this in the United States. And so I came back. I, I rented Navy Pier, never having put on anything bigger than Christmas dinner, and <laughs> just you know started to work it and you know i made a lot of mistakes in the beginning every because i'd never done this sort of thing but but it resonated with everybody and it kept growing and we are the largest um family focused you know uh, show in the united states for toys and games yeah yeah it's it's incredible and um i i love how it grew uh, out of a, a spirit of, of cooperation and collaboration. Um, I, and, and it's not like a, a lot of shows that are like someone gets together and say, okay, we're going to make some money and let's put, the, put this show on. Yours was just a real kind of uh, authentic, um, uh, you know, creation. It definitely was. I, I kept my day job for the first eight years to pay for the losses in the beginning. Um but then I was able to finally quit um, my, I was in real estate. So, mm-hmm. and I've never looked back. Like this is, this was, you know, my tribe, if you will. These people are my tribe. Yeah. Yeah. What can um, families do to encourage their kids creativity, whether it's in, in the realm of, of art or writing or inventing toys? Well, I think, that um, well, a lot of local toy stores now have inventor programs. We've given them materials, and so if you check with your local toy store, they might have a program, a camp, an inventor camp, um, is one way. And we also have self-starter materials for inventing on our website, on the um, Shytag website, uh, Shytag like Chicago Toy and Game, uh, or you could. You could type in Young Inventor Challenge, and it'll take you to the page, too. And they're just free materials. We welcome anybody to use them. Um, We want to encourage creativity. But I think um, a lot of parents need to turn off the screens. I'm not anti-screen by any means. Mm -hmm. I think I like to look at it as, you know, like food, right? Sometimes you you want a McDonald's, and sometimes you want a full Sunday night dinner, and, and none of it is is bad necessarily but if you do any any of them all the time then it is bad right right it's just like everything in moderation Mm -hmm. um but i think like i i see my daughter with her child my granddaughter and they have some pretty strict rules in this and my granddaughter can entertain herself for hours it's really fascinating to watch um and she reads my daughter my daughter reads several books a night to her to her daughter and there's a real love of reading there mm-hmm. and in fact my granddaughter's three years old and she has memorized some of these books to the point it, it looks like she's reading uh-huh. but she's just memorized you know the words and flipping the pages it's funny yeah well that's that's how kids start to read and get their confidence so good good for your daughter i'm i'm, I'm really happy um, and, and that's good advice, uh, I, I think, um, for parents. Uh, it, it's okay for kids to be bored because they, they'll, they'll yeah. figure it out. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I was just that's at an event, I was just at an event um, in New Jersey um, earlier this week, and one of the things I saw was a, a baby and um, a very busy mom and trying to get um, things done. But this kid was really, really young. And um, uh, mom popped a screen in front of the kid. And uh, it was clear that the mom does this a lot because the kid knew how to swipe to go to the next show. Wow. And uh, I thought, oh, I'm glad I didn't, I didn't, glad I didn't have a smartphone when my kids were young because I I might have been tempted to do the, the same thing. Right. It yeah. is right. It is easy. It's too easy to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Well, we should tell everybody, you mentioned the website. It's shytag.com, correct? Yes, C-H-I-T-A-G.com. And when you go to the homepage, you have choices, the fair, the Young Inventor Challenge, the Toy and Game Inventor of the Year Awards, or we also have a conference right before the fair if you have toys and toy and game ideas. So we're talking about the fair, so they just need to click on the fair. Okay. And um, and if you want to save on tickets, you can use the promo code READ, R-E-A-D, at uh, checkout, and uh, you get a little discount in savings. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. The, and, and the discount is great, but the tickets are already – Pretty reasonable. Um, here in Boston, I don't know what it costs to take your kids to a, a sporting event in Chicago, but um, to go to a Red Sox game or, or a Patriots game here in uh, the Boston area, it can cost the family five or six hundred dollars. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I, I often, I my my niece fell in love with hockey when she was in the uh, eighth grade. And I wanted to take her to a game. We live in the city of Boston, but going going to the, to the Bruins at at the Boston Garden, it's it costs sixty dollars to park and go in and the concessions and everything. And it was out of my budget and out of curiosity. Providence is just a a, a short drive from Boston, and they have the the Bruins minor league team there. And I bought two season tickets for the baby bees that it would have cost me for one ticket to go to one game. In, in Boston, and so we spent the season um, going to minor league hockey, and she had the greatest time. Um, you don't have to spend a fortune to entertain your kids and to have fun with your kids, and I think um, the Chicago Touring Game Fair is proof of that. Right, yeah, the tickets are $12 for an adult, 6 for a child, and under 3 is free, and with your discount code, your promo code, READ, they're 25% off of that. And parking is only fifteen dollars in Rosemont. What so, a deal. sorry, I said, what a deal! It is a deal, and O'Hare is right next door to Rosemont with free shuttles. We actually have people that come in for the day, fly in for the day. As crazy as that sounds, um, they, because it is so conveniently placed between right. next to O'Hare and. And there's transportation into the city, and we have people that make a staycation out of it because there's so many hotels, reasonably priced hotels around Rosemont, um, and with special rates. We also have some, I think, as low as uh, $151 a night with all the free uh, chocolate chip cookies you can get at the Double Tree. <laughs> Well, that's great. We want to encourage everybody to check out the Chicago Toying Game Fair. If you come, be sure you come over to the Reading With Your Kids booth and meet some books and possibly be interviewed to be heard on a future episode of the show. Um, Mary, it's been so so much fun catching up with you. Thank you for, thank you for creating such a, a wonderful family event. Oh, it, it's been my pleasure to do this. I love it. It's a passion project. Yeah. Well, we want to, again, we want to encourage everybody, check it out, Chicago Toying Game Fair. Um, come on over to the Reading With Your Kids booth and have a great time. We've been speaking to the founder of the event, Mary Cousins. Mary, thank you so very much for being with us. Well, thank you, Jeff, for having me. Hey, are you ready to ignite a passion for reading in your students? Introducing bookandauthor.com. Your gateway to literacy connections. With bookandauthor.com, connecting your school with talented authors of captivating kids' books has never been easier. Simply visit our user-friendly website and explore our extensive database of authors. Filter your search based on budget, genre, and availability. Discover the perfect match for your school and your students. But that's not all. With bookandauthor.com, you have the power to request a proposal. Let vetted authors come to you with their tailored ideas, ensuring an unforgettable literacy experience for your students. Don't wait any longer to inspire young minds through the magic of books. Visit bookandauthor.com today and open the door to a world of literacy connections. Bookandauthor.com, where literacy comes to life.
Join us right now from New York State, not too far away from New York City. Our guest is here today to celebrate her trumpet, the Miracle Wolf Pup series. Please welcome to the show, Leocadia George. Hey, Leocadia, how are you? I'm great. Great. Glad to be here. And thank you for having me. I'm delighted to have you on. Leo Cadia was one of the many amazing authors I met at the Indie Author Summit out in Kansas City. What a great event that was. It was. Uh, met so many amazing people. Um, learned a lot. So i um, really grateful for, um, for going there, uh, for Jay putting that on. You know, I highly recommend anybody go to his events at the um, Indie Author Summit. So it was wonderful. Yep. And the J that Leo Cadia is min, uh, mentioning is Jay Miletsky, who is a guest here on the show uh, about six, six or seven months ago. Um, one of the things that I am so impressed with um, and attending these book events is, is that for the most part, I would say 95 percent of the authors that I meet in the kid lit world are just super down to earth friendly, caring people. Yes. And supportive of, of each other. I, you know, that was something I was a little surprised to see um, in this world because, you know, there is a sense of competition, but um, I guess it's kind of like the restaurant theory. If you're the only restaurant there, no one's coming, but if you have a couple of restaurants, all of a sudden everybody's coming to all the restaurants. So maybe it's a bit of that, or it's just, super supportive people. I don't know. I, I think, well, I think if you get into the business of um, wanting to write for families, for kids there, that comes from a, a good place, I think. Yeah. And, and great stories. I mean, so many different great stories to bring to children. Uh, it's just wonderful. So tell us about Trumpet. Um, who Who is this character we're going to fall in love with, I'm sure? Well, this character is actually a real wolf. Uh, she's a critically endangered Mexican gray wolf. She lives at the Wolf Conservation Center, um, which is part of a breeding program to save uh, two critically endangered species, the Mexican gray wolves and the red wolves. Um, and I started volunteering there almost 10 years ago, and I started to learn some of the stories behind some of these wolves, and I just really started to learn about her story in particular. First of all, her nickname is Trumpet. Um, what a great nickname for, for a wolf. It's just absolutely fun and definitely um, a bit of her personality, so, uh, so it was great to kind of learn her story. Um, and as I learned her story, I kind of realized this is the perfect story for young children. Um, she was an only wolf to her father um, and her mother at the time. Uh, he had no other wolves, and usually in a pack, uh, they'll have a couple wolves in a litter. And it, just from fertility problems, she was the only one. And he was the most genetically distinguished wolf in the entire program. So they really wanted him to have a lot of puppies and just had Trumpet. And so she is now the most genetically distinct in the U.S. population. Um, and just at being a single wolf, it, it's easier for kids to kind of attach to one character versus a lot of characters. Um, and that's what I wanted. I wanted kids to kind of learn about the wolves and as young children they usually learn about one first and then can expand that on to to more wolves so i just felt that that part of it was great for young children but also you know it, it is based on a true story um they kind of found her as a surprise <laughs> Um, so that's also a great way to share a story with kids. They love surprises. Um, and so the way they found her, I was like, you have to start telling this to kids. Um, and so I kind of realized, and I didn't know this at the time, how difficult, right? You know, not, not just writing a book, but getting the book marketed out there is, um, 
so obviously they couldn't take that on their plate. So I asked them if I could write it and I went ahead and did it. That's, that's wonderful. So you, you've teased this a couple of times. How did they find Trumpet? So um, I think they had a little bit of a suspicion that um, Trumpet's mom, whose name is uh, Rosa, um, that she had a puppy or puppies because um, she she started having growing some um, nipples. And so um, it was one of the volunteers there um, who kind of heard a noise coming from a, a box that's in the enclosures. These are capture boxes. We use them for the health checks. Um, so the wolves will end up running into the box and they can then close the box up and lift it open and do the health checks without having to sedate the wolves. Um, but she was up there, I think, for doing the waters, um, changing the water buckets. And she heard this noise and um, kind of looked in and lo and behold, there was a puppy in there. And so um, they all came and, uh, you know, there was this what they started calling a miracle pup because um, the fertility issues were quite severe with the father. He was um, not able to have puppies really. Um, so, you know, once you start calling a miracle pup, I, it just kind of fell together, trumpet the miracle wolf pup. Um, so that's, that's how they found her. You mentioned that trumpet is now the most genetic, genetically distinct wolf. What, what does that mean exactly? So um, when they found the wolves, uh, the Mexican gray wolves, um, this was, I think, back in the 60s or 70s, um, they realized the population was going down and they went in to find them. Um, they were only found in uh, Mexico and there was only seven left in the, in the world. Um, so I... At that point, Mexico had said, you know, this we we can't save this population um, because it now will take scientists to, to you know, geneticists and a breeding program. So um, they gave them to the U.S. and um, they started the breeding program. So they're all descended from seven wolves, which really becomes very challenging with genetics. Um you know, it's probably someone else who should really explain the nitty gritty about that. But at this point, the wolves that are in the wild in um, Arizona and New Mexico, they're actually considered full siblings to each other genetically. Um, and so the breeding program outside of the wild in captivity, um, I think, is really to bring more genetic diversity and Trumpet has a big role in that because um, her her genes are not very well represented in the wild. Now they are. She she has um, had a couple of uh, of her puppies cross fostered into the wild, and so now her um, her gene pool is represented in the wild, um, which you know makes a big difference for um, for wolves breeding in the wild to, to have like a you know, that more of that diversity there. Um, so, you know, but, but it is a still a very huge, huge challenge. Yeah, I bet. I bet. I, it, I, I find it fascinating uh, that wolves and coyotes are cousins to my little Augie who, who just passed away and my daughter's dog. I'm sorry. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. And my son's dog. These, these creatures that, that come into our house and become part of our families are, are kin to wolves and coyotes. So um, actually, the, um, all dogs are descendant from wolves. Mm -hmm. So um, they're 98 wolf genetically. Um, and all those fun um, features that dogs have, tail wagging that, you know, wanting to be with you all the time that, you know, that whining, that, that, that fun stuff, that playing, um, that's all, you know, coming from the wolf, how they, um, treat each other in their pack. So, um, 
you know, we, we do have to be thankful for, you know, man's best friend being um, existing is because of wolves and, you know, how the evolution of that. Went. Yeah. It's really fascinating. I'm, because I'm guessing as a volunteer, and I, I might be completely wrong about this, but as a volunteer, you're not cuddling up with Trumpet and no. patting her. She and- wants nothing to do with me. Um, she'll run away from me, um, which is fine. That's the that's the way it should be. Um, the best thing for these wolves is to be fearful of humans, and they they are. Um, so. You know, just because I can't cuddle with her doesn't mean I can't respect her and, you know, value her. Um, and which is also another great reason why, you know, her book, com- her, she can give something to us through her story. Um, we can relate to her through her experiences um, as she's growing up, as she, you know, um, the, the di- various things that she does, you know, having a family, we can relate to her and we don't need to cuddle with her. Um, and so I, that's what I found another way to, for us to kind of relate to her. How did you become interested to the point where you're volunteering? It was actually uh, my sister-in-law um, in Italy so, um, and she, and she, you know, I'm a wolf convert. Uh, you know, I, I definitely respected wolves, um, you know, in all wildlife, but, um, she was the one who absolutely loved wolves and still does. And she's in Italy and she, and uh, my brother came to visit one year and, uh, she found the wolf conservation center. I didn't even know it existed. Um, and so she wanted to go there and visit, and that's that's how I got it. One, you know, when I went there, I was just, you know, they had me at hello, even though they weren't saying hello to me. <laughs> what? Obviously, we can, uh, as as we're reading Trumpet stories with our kids, we can talk about wolves. Maybe the differences between um, wolves and dogs. I, I I don't know if you know that. How did? How did that separation happen where you had uh, all dogs at some point, you said, descended from wolves? How, yeah. did, how did we get the the pets in our home, but there's still there are other wolves that are out there in the wild? But what, um, how come they yeah. all didn't come in together or how come they right. all? Right, yeah, uh, that's that. And that's, that's the question. I mean, we're going back to like caveman days, you know, so... Um, the question is why some of the wolves, you know, decided to stay at the campfire and the others said, no, thanks. Um, and pretty much that was it. That continuous socialization process, um, started becoming, um, an evolutionary process, um, as, you know, the generation after generation. Um, and at some point, uh, humans tried to, uh, genetically alter uh um the dogs or basically um breed certain characteristics of certain dogs together to make them these different breeds of dogs um so even though you have little chihuahua you know that's still 98 percent wolf um same as the husky but at some point, you know, some of the people wanted, you know, a, a dog that's more, uh, you know, bigger and able to pull a sled, wander a little bit more, assist with perhaps um, hunting. So um, that's that's how that process came about. But I certainly wasn't there for it. So I can't say for me <laughs> definitive why what, <laughs> some of the wolves stayed and some left. <laughs> I, you know, I. As you're talking about that, I'm I'm thinking, what a fun activity it would be to just sit down and imagine with your kids, kind of tell a story. What do you think about what, if you were there back in those? Back yeah, in those days, if you were sitting around that campfire, I, what, what do you think uh, that would have been like? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I it, it definitely is a curious, and you know. Back in, back in that day, you know, you had to, you know, 
be on your toes. You had to be flexible as far as um, hunting. You had to use everything that was available to you. And there perhaps was an assistance process where um, both parties, the wolf and the human, said, hey, we can both benefit from this. We can both get a meal and I can do this and you can do that. And as a team, we'll work well together. I'm thinking, too, that this would be a a great way to get our kids interested in um, some of the STEM fields. Yes, yes, 100 percent, because I mean, and and I say this, um, this whole process of saving these wolves takes all of us as a team from the top geneticists to the kid that's just going to bring perhaps these books or just some information to their classroom and say, hey, let's talk about wolves and the importance of wolves. Um, And it's all important, you know, everybody working together. Um, And which is, I also think, a great reason for these books because they do appeal to young kids. Um, And it is from three to eight recommended, but I have gotten feedback from people that said, my two-year-old loves this this book. And um, they sit down, they listen to it, and, um, you know, they're they're taking it in. And I think it's a great way to introduce young kids to the idea of conservation without overwhelming them. And it also brings them into the conversation because Mm -hmm. That conversation usually is something that's, you know, a a little bit more difficult for them to understand. But if they're included, they can at least agree and um, listen a little bit. And I think that's and and have their voice. I think that's a great idea to bring every everybody in the family together, parents, older siblings, young kids, all having a conversation. What? Just to kind of finish up, I, I, I imagine that there's some people out there thinking, oh, why are we saving wolves? They, they eat uh, cattle, they attack sheep, they, they, they don't come in the house and cuddle with me. Uh, why is it important for us to save the wolves? Um, so I, you know, they are keystone species, um, top of the food chain. And with that, you know, um, they do have their role in basically um, creating a balance from uh, top top prey animals, the ungulates, the bigger prey. Um, and it, it assists all the way down to the little mouse, the field mouse. Um, what will happen is when wolves are not in the area, um, those top prey animals, those ungulates, will eat everything to the ground. And so what ends up happening is those young saplings never develop and they never develop into trees. Um, And that's really important for all of the environment to to develop. You have a tree, you have a home for birds, for smaller animals. You don't have that, then they won't be there. And so um, it does really create an overall balance um, to the environment. So that's why they're important. I will have to say, um, you know, that they do, they can go after livestock a lot less than, um, than I ha- their reputation, um, gives them because they are scared of humans, but they, they have gone after livestock. And I think it is a really important conversation to have with, um, ranchers and farmers to be able to, um, find a way to dissuade wolves, um, scare wolves off um, so that they are not, are not coming after the livestock. Ultimately, I think that, um, you know, we can work together with ranchers. There's many organizations. Um, the Voyagers uh, Project has been working with um, some farmers and ranchers and with success. Um, and so there are plenty of other organizations working with farmers and ranchers. I think we do have to have more of that so that we can coexist together, be um, be neighbors. It's ultimately, um, 
it's better for the environment overall for wolves to be out there. Where can we go to find out more about Trumpet, the Miracle Wolf Pup, and more about you? Um, so my email is leocadiageorge.books at gmail.com. Um, so I'm available there. You can learn um, more about the books at Briley and Baxter Publications. Um, and you can also learn more about Trumpet at the Wolf Conservation Center site newyorkwolf.org um and also you can just you know look up you, you know do some doing work with uh um the wolves also there's over 50 different facilities in the throughout the country and many of them are zoos so you can see if there's a zoo around your area um that has Mexican gray wolves there or um, red wolves. For instance, in your area would be Stone Zoo. Uh, Stone Zoo is not that far and they do have um, Trumpet's half siblings. So her mom was able to have more puppies with another male wolf. Um, she ended up having nine. So she went from one to nine. Awesome. Boy, is that a shock. Um, and six of the brothers, the male wolves, went up to Stone Zoo. And so um, it's really, it was really nice to go see them uh, after a couple of years. And so they're doing well there. Awesome. We've had a great time learning about wolves and talking about Trumpet, the Mountain Wolf Up series from our guest, Leo Katia George. My friend, thank you so much for being on Reading With Your Kids. Thank you. Um, have a wonderful day and happy reading. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Reading With Your Kids and will join us for the next exciting episode of the show. In fact, we hope that you've enjoyed this episode so much that you are inspired to write a five-star review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you find this show. And if you're listening on the WREB, MFM 24-7 Radio Network, please let your local station manager know that you love reading with your kids and thank that station manager for carrying the show. Please connect with us on social media, facebook.com slash reading with your kids, at reading with your kids on Instagram, and at Jedley Magic on X. We have a great YouTube channel where you can find all of our Drawing With Your Kids videos and our STEM is Family Fun videos. You can also find many, many episodes, especially the latest episodes of Reading With Your Kids at our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash reading with your kids. We would love for you to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Check out our blog. Visit our Reading With Your Kids certified great read wall of fame and use the contact button at the top of the page. To send us a message, let us know what you love about the show, let us know what we could be doing better, and let us know who you would like to hear on a future episode of the show. And, and, and if you want to suggest yourself, that's fine. However, the best thing to do if you would like to be a guest here on the show is visit readingwithyourkids.com and click on the Authors Click Here button up at the top of the page. That way you can find out how you can be a guest here on the podcast. It's fun, it's easy, and it gives you the chance to tell thousands of kidlit fans all over the world about your fantastic children's book. You can also discover our really effective and very affordable promotional packages at, uh, at readingwithyourkids.com under that author's click here button. Want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, we want to start by thanking our guests. Mary Cousins, we'd love to see you at the Chicago Toy and Game Fair. Go to shytag.com and use the promo code READ at checkout to save money on the already incredibly, uh, incredibly affordable tickets. We also want to thank Leo Katia George. Please be sure to check out her book, Trumpet, The Miracle Wolf Pup. I want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Chris Doherty, Rory Grady, Raylene Tang. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place. And you do that every time you read with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next episode of Reading 
with your kids. Oh, <laughs> 